Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Club Metaverse podcast. Today, I am joined by the one and the only Harold Faltermeyer, author of uh, Where's My Orchestra, My Story, Academy Award uh, 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 nominated composer um, for, I believe, original song for Shakedown in Beverly Hills Cop 2, which is one of my favorite tracks, by the way, but we'll get into that later. Um, Composer uh, for Top Gun, for Beverly Hills Cop, for Fletch. Uh, the list goes on and on. You've been around the industry for such a long time, and I'm so glad to get a chance to chat with you, Harold. How are you today? I'm good, Mark. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, yeah, cool, man. So, so Harold, I, I want to kind of get right into it because I, I'm also a musician. I'm a very bad musician, but I am a musician. You know, you know, musician. So I understand that kind of uh, drive of wanting to express yourself with this amazing mathematical scientific you know language that that's actually very flexible but also very strict you know and it's not the easiest thing to sort of wrap your head around how did your journey into being a musician start when it all started when i looked on on the hands of my father he was a wizard on a piano and he was not he was not a pro but he was he was he was just he was just good and he had huge hands I remember <laughs> and um, I watched him playing a piano and he was just he was just soaring through that keyboard and I said hey hey pa I want to I want to study this instrument and I was about five years old so I got p- a piano lessons and then mm. that's how it all started and when, when when you were taking the piano lessons did you feel like it was something that was very natural. Um, to you or did you feel that it was actually something that was very difficult but you wanted to kind of fight through it because music is is not easy right and it's not for everybody no. How, what, did you take to it right away uh, you know it was it was fun when i when i watched my my father and it was it was hell when i f- when i first found out that i have to practice it was terrible. I was a kid, you know, I wanted to, to play soccer, football or whatever, go to the forest or so. And now I'm sitting here in front of a keyboard and um, no gain, no, no pain, no gain. So I had to work. And this was in the first place, a, a very painful. But I found out and I learned very, very, very fast that without that, I would not make it. And, and when, when did you go um, into like a conservatory as a young man? Did you pretty much... Uh, focus on music full time, or was music always more of a hobby uh, to you? Like at your early age, uh, in, in the very early age, it was a hobby, but it it, um, it 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 changed pretty soon into a possible um, passion and a possible profession, because my my school uh, uh, rates were rather bad, and at the end, I ended up as a school dropout. I didn't finish anything because I was I was just too focused on music. So my dad saw that, and um, he managed to to get me in the uh, in the conservatory, though, because I was I was um, how would you say that? Yeah, it's it's something we call it überbegabt in Germany. It's something you you're very you're very talented, you know. And mm. without without being having the matura, as we say in Germany, um, I could study music. The only thing which I could not study. And not uh, um, uh, put put off as a as a as a pro then is to be a teacher or a professor or something like this because mm. I'm I'm not educated you know but I didn't care at the end I, I made I made it anyway so I was very lucky and um, music then of course was my profession and um, my very very first boss said to me now since you have um, uh, made your hobby music to your profession. Um, you should rather find a hobby pretty soon, you know, another one. <laughs> right. And that's what I did. And I'm, I'm still fighting all the hobbies I'm having. Yeah, yeah. What, 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 what are some of your hobbies? Oh my, my, I mean, the list is endless. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a scuba diver. I'm oh, a, me too. I'm, I also scuba dive. I love scuba oh, diving. I, I, love, I love that. I did it as a kid already. Then I started to, to fly. I, I'm a, I was a private pilot. Then I, then I became a commercial pilot. I was flying oh, wow. a little jet. Then I'm doing I'm doing mountain climbing. I do I play golf. I I I I, I go skiing in the winter. I go I do everything. You know, it's that's fun. awesome. Do you still fly to to this day? 
I just, I just, I just gave it up because um, you know uh, Munich actually is not really, really um, good for private uh, piloting for general mm. aviation anyway. Um, so we, we we don't have this this nice little airport anymore. We have a huge airport, and the whole aviation was more or less kicked out of Munich. So it was no fun, you know. Would I would I have lived probably in in Salzburg, where my wife has a nice flat in the middle of the town? And if I would have met her earlier, I probably would have never given up because it's such su such fun. And I have a relationship with the guys from from Red Bull. They have this 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 uh, array of of helicopters, of jets, and everything, which I could wow. go flying with them all the time, you know. But it was too late. So first of all, you just blew my mind, and there's definitely more questions that I have about your younger years. But you just blew my mind because my my last guest that I just had on the show was is Jack Epps Jr., who was oh, really? the, uh, yeah, who was the screenwriter of Top Gun, right. and I discovered that he was also a pilot. You know, oh, so. Really? I I didn't know that. Look at that. Yeah, yeah. So he actually was a pilot uh, his whole life, you know, and, and that's why he wrote the script. And, you know, you're also a pilot, which kind of blows my mind. And Tom Cruise is a pilot, you know? Yeah. So it's like everybody says, oh, you know, because um, when I was growing up, you know, like I went to NYU film school. And when I was growing up, um, we always put Don Simpson in this pedestal as this guy who invented what we used to call in university, the only true American school of cinema was Don Simpson's high concept. Right. And, and you know, and there was a, all this thesis around it. And we always gave Don Simpson all the credit that he had this high concept, right. For, you know, for a movie. And then he would have a production staff underneath him create this and not have to ask him any questions because they could always point towards the high concept. And if it didn't match the high concept, then you knew that it wasn't right. But right. in reality, with this movie, with Top Gun, it's actually everybody involved understood the subject matter in a very intimate level. And like that's something that I never really knew before, you know, like until I started doing these conversations. But, you know, anyway, we'll get to Don uh, Simpson and Top Gun in a little bit. But I want to ask you about one thing, because as a musician, I'm fascinated by this because I struggle with this. Um, I read in your bio that when you were very young, a professor uh, uh, said that you had absolute pitch. What what does that mean? Well, it it actually means that that you listening to listening to a tone, you could determine which tone it really is. While if you have that's that's what they call a, a perfect pitch. Um, the, the the opposite to that is is actually is relative pitch. So hmm. if you have if you play a note and you play an interval to it, you know, um, like like if you take C and play a G, then you have a, a, a fifth, right? So right. Um, the the guy with the with the with the, the relative pitch can say it's a fifth. The guy with the with absolute pitch uh, with with perfect pitch can say it's a C and a G. Wow, that's fascinating. That's, you know, because like that's actually the difference. What one of the, my you know when when me and my buddies get together and we smoke a doobie, it's always one of our favorite kind of questions to ask: um, Is music an invention or is it a discovery? And after many many conversations with me and my friends, we we're all pretty convinced that music is a discovery and that and that it's not an invention. And that if you ever were to come across a, a, another species that has music that their music will, will actually be quite similar uh, theoretically as our music is following very, very similar rules because just like physics are shared across the universe, the physics of music are also shared across the universe. And even to your point about the third and the fifth, um, when you hit a string and you hit it in the middle Right, you get um, the fifth, I believe. Right, like 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 if you hit it by itself, it's the it's the root. In the middle, it's the fifth, and then if you uh, cut that in half again, it's the third. Right. right. So and, and then the one, the three, and the five give you the chord. So I mean that that to me is just like fascinating. Do, do you think music is an, is a human invention or do you think it's a discovery? Well, I th I think music is a discovery. I, I think the the, the inno, innovation and the in, invention of music is is uh, are the twelve tones, mm. because that's that's what that's what the what the, the rule is. You have the twelve tones. You have the octaves. You have um, 
we have rules and whatever. I think that's a that's an then that's an innovation. But when you when you when you play uh, melodies in in uh, in inside of this uh, of this keyboard, then or you you hum something, I think you discover music because you are discovering. Mm. You're discovering melodies, or you're discovering chords, chord uh, structures, uh, rhythm loops, rhythm structures, and I think that's a that's a discovery. And and um, you you obviously um, you know your your first. I don't want to jump around too much because I, I'm so fascinated with how you went from uh, your education into this crazy world of American cinema. Um, your first project, I believe, was Midnight Express with Alan Parker uh, back in 1978. Um, how did that come about? Did you already do some work maybe in your home land of Germany or, or did you move to the U.S.? How did you break in into those early days of being a composer for cinema? It, um, it, it was um, due to the fact that Giorgio Moroda, who was the composer on, on, on Midnight Express, mm -hmm. um, Owned a studio in Munich, which was world famous then. It was Musicland Studios. Um, he did all his disco stuff with Donna Summer there. He rented out the studio to Queen, to the Stones, to Billy Squire, and God knows whom else. So um, I was working in another studio uh, owned by the Deutsche Grammophon Gesellschaft, the, the famous classic label, mm -hmm. a couple of miles south of that. And Munich is a very small town when it comes to music. So um, he heard about that I'm doing electronic music, that I'm, I'm somehow trained uh, classically. And he called and he said, look, I'm doing a, a movie. I'm doing a movie score. I don't really know how to do it. I never did it, but they asked me to do it. And <laughs> as, you, as, you, as you know, uh, Giorgio back then was larger than life. He, was, he, had, he, had a, he came out of two or three number one hits with Donna and uh, so, uh, Neil Bogart, the head of Casablanca Records, um, was involved in, in movies already, and he asked him, would you do a, a, a movie score? And this is, this is a typical Hollywood thing. If you, if you are not a film musician um, and you have a, a unique sound, you become something like, um, I would say, the taste of the day. You know, mm. and so people are people are to us are are trying to always get new new combinations together. So at that time, it was obviously the taste of the day asking Giorgio Moroda to write a movie score. Right. So, so he so he did it, and and he started to put out put uh, some sketches together, um, including the famous uh, uh, Chase, which then made it even to the to the to the Hot Hundred. And uh, he started to, to wiggle and wail in his studio. And, and, and then he called me and said, you know, I need some help. I don't know how to do all these things. So I'm going over to Musicland Studios. I, I met him for the very first time. And we talked and he said, you know, I have to, I don't know how we synchronize a, 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 a tape machine and, and, a, and a video machine. I don't know all this shit. So I said, well, I, quite frankly, I don't know either. So we we tr we tried a try and error. You know, we, we worked on the on the on the on the on the score. I did some arrangement with strings. Right. I, I programmed some synthesizers. Then he played on something. Then we tried to to uh, synchronize these two things, and we started simultaneously like little kids. We didn't know how to sync a, a, a bloody tape recorder with a bloody uh, video recorder. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and did you work with Giorgio Moroder? Because, like, yeah. he, you did. You worked uh, closely oh, yeah. with him. Yeah, quite a lot, quite a lot. And so we we sent we sent the, the, this this layouts to to the states and and sent it to Alan Parker, and uh, and then they put it in a professional way against the picture. So all of a sudden we had a sync. We had somebody who took care of of. Of getting this thing uh, off the ground, we had a music editor telling us what to do, and all of a sudden uh, it started to work. And this was this was this was really funny to do it like this. And it was like an experiment. It was like a like a huge laboratory, you know, with bent needles and and cables all around. And we 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 did something, and of course it was uh, the mainly. To, to get this off the ground, but I, I did I did my part on that. And at the end, 
it earned Giorgio an, an, an Academy Award for best score at, in this year, you know, and this was quite remarkable. Yeah, yeah, that 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 is quite remarkable. Um, did did you um, then through this kind of uh, first of all, you know, before I go there, um, were you influenced or or how did you start to get? Because one of the things that you pretty much invented, at least in my childhood, like I don't know if it's actually true from an academic perspective, but your usage of electronic instruments is you know revolutionary at least from a pop culture perspective right whether or not there's other people that people will tell me oh no you're wrong because in 19 da, 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 this guy did this and this guy did that that's irrelevant in terms of it actually um becoming part of the mainstream culture um your scores and your use of electronic instruments became um a huge kind of trendsetter for the entire you know world of music did you, um, how, how did you start experimenting with like electronic, uh, you know, music? Was it already back in, in you know, with, with Georgia Moroder that, that you started touching into that? Oh, yeah. I did, I did work with the first synthesizers. I had, I had my first MOOC when it came out. Before that, I, I used an, an, an oscillator in the studio where you normally uh, um, uh, align tape machines or whatever. And um, I tried to I tried to make it work, and and I was just turning the knob and and change the pitch, you know, on that just to make to experiment with sounds. And I put I put more volume into it. Then I saw that we had some distortion, and all of a sudden we had a square wave, we had a, 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 a sawtooth wave or whatever. So I was a, a very early um, um, user of this kind of things, and um, it of course helped a lot to. Um, to finish a, a score like Midnight Express, yeah. and my music was always uh, um, very, very electronic driven. And, uh, and uh, you know, I adored, I adored the work of Vangelis. I adored the work mm. of, 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 uh, of uh, the Tangerine Dream or, or um, the, thing, the things I adored most uh, was, was Kraftwerk because it was, yeah, so, yeah. it was so innovative in one kind and so precise. And... Then I got my then I then I got my first job doing doing a, a movie for for Brookheimer and Simpson, and they they had they had more the touch of of like tension and dream kind of things you know very elegic pads and very ominous and, and very 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 moody in one kind. So that movie did not so so good. But once we did this movie. Um, Simpson said to me, um, we have a new movie out, which is completely different. And you would have to change your approach to electronics completely because we want to do an experiment. And <laughs> wow. I knew what that was. We, we had like, it, it was a, a blank page, a blank white page of, of no music. And it was try and error. And out came the uh, the aesthetic and and the uh, the the way of using electronics in uh, Beverly Hills Cop. And yeah, which the, which which you know, for the people that don't, obviously, if you're listening to this, you know that you know you know that song. That song was in the top five in the like yeah. as a pop uh, culture, like you know, as a pop hit. It wasn't just like which which rarely ever happens these days anymore, where a score without music. Right, because I, I'm sorry, with with without without lyrics, yeah, yeah. Um, breaks the top five. You know, I mean that never happens. You know anymore. I mean it's just like I can't even. Yours might be the last one that did it. You know, so it, it's. What which was the movie that you worked on with Don Simpson before Beverly Hills Cop? It was a, a Thief of Hearts. Oh wow! I didn't even know that Don Simpson did that. Yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a movie they did. To, they did. Uh, Brookham and Simpson did. And they they asked me to do the the, the music because the the first movie I did with with uh, uh, Jerry Bruckheimer was again a Georgia Moroder movie. Um, it was American Gigolo with Richard Gere and Lauren. Yeah, Hunt. yeah, it's a, yeah, legend. So, Georgia did the music for that, and and Georgia hired me again for doing the synthesizers and all that kind of stuff and doing the arrangements. And this was where where Jerry Bruckheimer was in the studio all the time, and he was and I, I knew that he was looking at me, and he was. He was just inhaling um, everything I did, and I think this because I, I was 
I was pretty quick back then, and I, I could change mm. the sounds. And this was it was the beginning of MIDI, so you could you could swap a, a, a guitar against a clarinet or, or <laughs> do the, the most craziest things ever um, on 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 the fly. And he was he was fascinated by that. And I know that this was one of the reasons why why two years later he called me and said. We have a movie score and we want you to do it, not George. We want you to do it because I know how fast you are. I know how you can think and how That's incredible you are, you know, and that was this was Thief of Hearts. And and when you were working on Beverly Hills Cop and you had this 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 blank canvas, um, I mean, like I don't want to start humming it because you know it's going to sound terrible, but you know that's a that's a melody that's like locked in my brain for the rest of my life. And I remember being a little kid. And here in Miami, uh, where, where I grew up, we had a radio station that only played 16 songs. And it would play the top 16 songs over and over again, right? So it would go from one to 16 and then back to one. Um, and yours was always one, you know, for, for, for like a year. Um, you know, the Axel F. Foley theme was number one. How, what, was there a lot of experimentation to find that melody? Or was it instantaneous? Was it something you heard and then you transcribed? Give me a little insight about how that incredible memory was uh, melody was born. <laughs> it's a it was a strange story. Like you said, a blank piece of canvas, not knowing what to do, and the 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 need to do something because they needed they needed the score and and um, I tried really hard and I tried to experiment with different approaches. Like of course you go through all these things like. Um, could this work? Could could probably a a a a a, 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 a tangerine dream thing work? Could Vangelis mm. work? No, it nothing worked. Could could um, um, something work like like uh, like a, a Herbie Hancock or whatever? Are you going chess? Are you right? What what, what could work? And I tried and I tried, and um, I did the first layouts and the first sketches, and everybody was always just uh, uh, putting their head down and said, "No, nah, this doesn't work." And we had like um, three <laughs> or four approaches already on a on a theme. Nobody liked it, and I was not happy with it. Mm. And um, studio got nervous all of a sudden because we were we were a, a, like a madman's laboratory, and um, they needed the movie. And and this this was a movie which 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 in the in the first place in the first moments already was received very good it had mm. to be a hit movie right and, and eddie murphy was at the peak of his career eddie, and it was right eddie was huge and and then you eddie this this movie had to break big so and now there are there are a couple of guys including one one little german guy uh, experimenting with a couple of synthesizers god forbid the studio really got nervous <laughs> um, should we go back? Should they go back to the to the orchestra? Should they go back to Marvin Hamlish or whatever? You know, just just make something uh, um, traditional. You know, right? Like uh, like they always did. But there was there was Brockheimer, there was Simpson, there was Marty Brest, the director, and they really stood strong behind me. And wow. I did another layout of something, and they said, "Well, we, we are closing in. Some something like there." And I said, "Okay, guys, let's 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 leave leave me alone." And I looked again by myself into all the scenes I got from the movie, which were not complete, but but they yeah. they obviously mirrored a pretty fair amount of what the movie is going to be. So I I was sitting there in the night, and all of a sudden I I I touched I touched the synthesizer. I had I had the sound called up. Um, which then became the sound of, of XLF on a Jupiter 8, and I was just fiddling around, and I said, how can this melody go? How, what, what does it need? Has it, it has to go up, it has to go down, it has to be intelligent, it has to be interesting, it has to be, hmm, it has to be Eddie Murphy. And I looked at, I, I looked at his movements and, and, his, and his interesting... Um, uh, little little um, uh, um, blinks in his eyes and all that, mm. and I thought it has to be tiny, it has to be big. So I came up with don 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 don. I said, ah, I, I think I'm going right, the right <laughs> way. And then I, I continued. I said, well, why not, not why not keeping it going up all the time? Like don 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 don
So wow. I experimented with that. And I, I, I played the melody against the picture. And believe me or not, all of a sudden I had what, you, what I always have when, when something is right. You get like goosebumps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, this must, this must be it. And I was really fascinated by yeah. what I did. And I started to, to record that. I started to record a counter bass line. I found some, some very jumpy um, uh, um, beats, you know, like, like I knew from the, from the guys who did break dance. It was like, mm. so I said, wow, this kind of, of, uh, of drum programming that did. I synchronized all that and I made a demo. And then I called the guys and said, guys, I think I have something. And they came back and we listened to it. When you say the guys, um, was your sort of trusted confidant Jerry and Don, or was it Martin Brest? Yeah. Or yeah. Yeah, it was it was Jerry, it was Jerry and Don. It was it was Marty Brest, obviously. Yeah. It was it was Billy Weber, it was my my technicians, it was Bob Badamy, our music editor, our, yeah. my dear, my really dear friend. And they were all coming in. And I played the theme and nobody was really reacting. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, this is probably the end of my days in Hollywood. I might, I might, <laughs> I might, I might be fired in five minutes. Simpson didn't say a word, Brockheimer didn't say a word. And, and you know, and how it is in, 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 in Hollywood. What do you think? I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. I, I don't think it works. Were you in person or were you in Germany and they were in LA? No, 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 no. We were we were sitting in a studio in LA. It was, in LA, okay, okay, cool, cool. It was really, it was really LA. So, um, and so nobody. I remember Billy Weber, the editor, said, "Ah, this this doesn't work at all, guys. We are going. Oh to my God, completely different. We're going to a diff, total different. This doesn't work. We need to do something else." So, um, the only guy who was really quiet was Martin Brest. Right, he right, said, right. And he said, "Why don't you guys now?" Or stop talking and let me hear it again. Oh, I like that. <laughs> I had to rewind. I had to rewind the tapes and and I played it again. And um, Marty really looked very very closely to the to the to the footage, and he was. I know he inhaled the music, and he tried to 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 um, to picture what it's gonna be on in different scenes. And I, I, I recall that he said, can I play this against another scene? I said, yes, of course. So we, we put up another video. He heard, heard it again. And he said, hmm, it is, it is, uh, and he, he used this word, which I, which I, I think is, it's marvelous. He said, it's delicious. I think it's <laughs> the, the best thing we could have. And, you know, then all of a sudden the ice was broken. And, right. and, and, and Simpson said, yeah, I think it's good. It, it's really great. <laughs> um, we should we should keep it, and then then Bruckheimer came in, and, and um, my my music editor said said I think it's it's wonderful, and and he said this is something really new, and all of a sudden they started to like it, and That's um, amazing. We continued, and we 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 put this the, the the theme against some some other scenes, and miraculously enough, it worked. It worked on every scene. We could use we could use the baseline on that when it. We, when it got really haunting, all of a sudden we had just do 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 you know right so right we right use the melody by itself. We could use just the footsteps. It was spooky. It 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 had it had it had so many usages all of a sudden, and so we knew we had with this little melody and its uh, companions like the bassline, the the percussion, all that. We had a we had a score written, and all of a sudden everything worked, and then the rest was. Of course, craftsmanship to put it against the pictures, and um, and uh, tailor it uh, the way the movie needed, and boom, we hit the score. And how close was the demo from a production standpoint to the final? Like, did you do many cleanups and many versions of it, or was it pretty close? It was pretty close because I had this one sound, which is the melody, and this was so. This was such a signature. That I, the, everything which I built around it right. was just was just uh, um, something. But we had the strong, the the, the 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 strong towers with the melody, the baseline, and the rhythm, and everything else you you needed and you put on because of a, a scene of a little of a little uh, uh, um, 
a, a, a scene you wanted to hit, something, a sting or whatever. But this, is, this was just little things. It was the majority of, of uh, towers, which were melody, bass, and, uh, and the drums. And, and Beverly Hills Cop became a gigantic success. You know, um, Jerry and, and Don obviously had, um, I believe they already had flash dance, and they had a few hits before that. But Beverly Hills Cop took them to a different level. You know, like um, it took them to heights, you know, unknown for them. Um, and um, the music became this kind of, you know, top of the charts type of track. Like, how did you, how did you sort of take all that in? Like when, when a young man who's already seen some success because you're working professionally and in music, if you're doing it professionally, you're already a success. It, it, story's over. Like you already won. But now when you become famous and, and, and your music is becoming an icon in the culture of music, how, how did that start to feel? And when did you first notice that this song was kind of elevating itself beyond a movie? Well, for a composer, it's heaven on earth when you, uh, uh, when you write a little piece of music and it's just melody and it doesn't have any lyrics and nothing, no, no singer. It's just your, your, your two hands you played it with. Yeah, and all of a sudden, <laughs> that's this, awesome. This, this hits the charts and it hits the charts big. And it, it, it was not just in, in the States. It was a worldwide success. It was a number one in, in England. It was number one, God knows where. It was top 10 probably all over the world. Yeah. And then you knew that you had, you, had a, you had a hit created, which nobody in the first place believed in. Even the, the record label said, um, we don't want any, any pieces of score on, 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 uh, on, on, our, on our soundtrack because we, we only need hit songs, you know, and a piece of score is not a hit. And it took some, it took some, some, uh, some days of convincing Irvin Azov that, we want to have uh, at least one or two little little uh, um, uh, pieces of score on the on the on the on the soundtrack, and then they said, "Yeah, yes, put it on, and 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 okay." And back then, we still had we still had had vinyl uh, um, uh, records. Yeah, and, um, we had vinyl releases, single releases, and I remember that Axel F was oh. was was the flip side, just the flip side on one of the Petty Labelle songs, you know. So, it's literally the the Axel F Foley theme, and it was that small disc. Um, God, I forget what what we used to call it. It was the small disc, you know, the small vinyl. Right. Uh, it was the, the, the whatever five inch or whatever. The, yeah, yeah. Which which spun faster, right? You had to make it spin a little bit faster. That exactly. was the first record I ever bought in my life myself. <laughs> was the Axel F Foley uh, double sided. Um, it was two versions of the theme. One was short, and then it went into a longer one. And yeah. then on the other side, it was like an even longer one or something. And yeah. um, that was my first record I ever bought because that song that, you know, I'm not going to sing it because I'm going to, you know, get crushed. But that that song was gigantic, you know, yeah. like, like, like it, you know, like it was, uh, God, it's so hard to describe it, but it was a, you know, it was like the Beatles, right? Like it was the Beatles of the eighties, you know, like it, like it felt like music that was of our time, right? It had that zeitgeist, you know, to right. use a German word of a very specific moment in history, this 1984 thing. And, and it's funny because in Miami, uh, when this song came out, Beverly Hills Cop, it was very inspirational um, to the culture that inspired Michael Mann um, you know, the, uh, the great television producer uh, to create Miami Vice. And mm. Miami Vice um, musically took its tones and its themes and I think a lot of its inspiration from the Axel F. Foley theme and then created this entire world of Miami kind of electronic music, you know, like that uh, John Hammer, um, who, uh, you know, maybe you've heard of, uh, of course, you know, who did like the Miami Vice theme and stuff oh, like yeah, that. Sure. Jan Hammer, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, like this was, that came after the influence of something like Beverly Hills, you know, cop, you know? Did, 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 did you feel kind of proud and your chest got a little bit bigger when you started seeing how you were shaping the entire culture of music? 
Oh yeah, sure. This was this this was, uh, I, you know, in the in the first place, you're not you're not such you're not so aware of it, but when the when it goes through the years now, and and you and you you know what what this kind this what the trigger of this melody was, and what the <laughs> trigger of this score was that that um, people uh, people all of, all of a sudden um, did not use orchestras anymore. They they used like electronic music because it was different, just because of the fact right. it was different, you know. And till to a, to a point where where um, you you try to 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 copy what we did on on, on Beverly Hills Cop, you know, but I could always see when when they used it when they used the claps, you know, this with the with the, with the oh delay. right right because then it became like a standard yeah. and every a single standard. electronic piano in the world yeah, had, had the had clap to, sound right. You had to have the Faltermeyer of the claps on on, <laughs> on, on, the, on your record, otherwise it wouldn't work. I mean, it was silly, but. That that was that this what this was fact. So so professionally speaking, after the incredible success of Beverly Hills Cop, you know um, there was a ton of movies that were based off of that thing, right? Everybody's chasing, you know, like the success. And another movie that I actually really love, and I thought the music was also great, uh, Chevy Chase in Fletch. Mm. Um, you know, how did you get come about getting that uh, uh, piece? Because that's not Don Simpson. That's not the same folks that you're working with. That's kind of you spreading your wings a little bit. I, I guess this this came because Beverly Hills Cop became a huge huge hit, and all of a sudden, I think the 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 the, the producers of Fletch were not so super super happy with what they had so far, uh, musical wise on on their on their on their movie, and they they must have heard Beverly Hills Cop and said, "This is it. That's what we want." <laughs> right. And I know I, I I got a I got a frantic call from my from my agent saying, "You have to." Please at least give them a chance. Uh, look at the movie if you like it, and um, they want you real bad to do this this music. And um, if you like it, you you probably should do it. It's a it's a it would be a good career move for you. So I'm I'm driving to Universal Studios, and they had they had arranged a huge screening room for me. And I was looking at the movie, and I have to tell you, I really like the movie. First of all, I like I like Chevy Chase. I th- oh, it's I think- a great movie. It's a it's very really underrated movie. movie. It's a great movie. It's a really great movie. And and I said I, I love the movie. And I was I was giggling to death because a couple of scenes, especially when he's Doctor Rosen Rosen and he's falling, <laughs> <laughs> and all all kinds of things. Then as an as an aviator, you know, when they come back with a jet and and he's trying to be a super cool mechanic, and he leans <laughs> against the hot the hot uh, the in intakes of, of the jet, you know. Right. And oh, and he goes back like this. I think this was hilarious, you know. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And I agreed to do the music to that, you know. And I had I had um, the theme in a couple of days, and I played it for them, and uh, they they all were super super happy. And so I completed the score. So, um, which is by the way, great. Um, another legend that I've heard for years is that you were in a studio, right? Um, a little bit after, or I'm not sure exactly when, but you were in a studio working on another Don Simpson, Jerry Bruckheimer film about airplanes and um, that you were um, in your studio and you heard a guitar playing in another studio um, and that this guitar was being played by Steve Stevens and that you somehow walked over to Steve Stevens and you guys on the spot without really knowing each other. Then look, this is the, the legend that I've heard, whether it's true or not. That's why I'm asking you the question that, that you heard Steve Stevens playing guitar in some other room in the studio and you walked over to him and somehow out of this chance meeting came the main uh, theme and the main melody for another iconic piece of music, which is the, theme and the score of Top Gun. Is this a true story? What's what's the real story behind this? Okay. The real story is a little different. Okay. Um, <laughs> but it has it has it has the it has the roots in all we just talked for the last 10 minutes. It had roots in Fletch and it had roots in in uh, in uh, um, in uh, 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 Billy Idol in in Steve Stevens and um, in of course Top Gun. So um, one when I did uh, uh, Beverly Hills Cup. 
uh, uh, Jerry Bruckheimer came to me and said, "We doing, we are doing another movie, which we want you to do the the, mu the music, which oh, is." Wow. And I said, Top Gun. So I said, yeah, it's about aviation and it's about, it's, it's about uh, very cool guys. And, it's, and, and he said to me in a very, very early uh, uh, stage, he said, you have to imagine Top Gun is going to be rock and roll in the sky. And I said, with, with this kind of briefing, I said, oh, great. Well, what should be a great movie? Because everything right, that's a high concept. That's a high concept right yeah. there. But this is, this, is a, this is a high concept. So... So um, I'm doing Fletch, and I knew Billy Idol from from works before because my my dear friend and colleague uh, Keith Forsey, who is the producer of Billy Idol, and who, and Keith was was the drummer on 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 almost every disco record back in Munich, including Donna Summer's work. And uh, Keith Forsey is the is the guy whom I wrote uh, Hot Stuff for Donna together. You know, so we are we are still close friends, and and Keith is producing Billy Idol. And Keith asked me a couple of times to play keyboards on on, on some Billy Idol tracks. So, for, for example, "Money Money," I played the organ, and oh, wow. uh, I did some other some some other uh, jobs for for him as a as a as a studio musician. And um, at that time, when I did Fletch, um, Billy and Steve were were playing uh, in, uh, um, in another studio next door, actually, um, and they were doing demos for their upcoming album. And I, of course, I knew Steve. I, I, I worked uh, 81. I was in New York, did, did Whiplash Smile with them. And um, I did lots of, lots of stuff with them. So, so um, then, then I, 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 was, I was composing a, a little piece for, for Fletch, actually. And it was a, it was a dream sequence when, when Chevy Chase tries to be Michael Jordan. Oh, right, um, right, with the basketball, with the afro. With the, and, yeah, yeah, right, with the afro. <laughs> So he's so so, and I had I had played um, some something like dong ding ding da 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 da, like dream, dreaming, you know. And I'm playing this, and I thought, man, this could be something for this scene. And all of a sudden, out of out of the blue, Billy Idol enters the door of my studio and says, "Hey, Harold, this is Top Gun. This is beautiful." They said, "Well, well, uh, hi, Billy. How, what are you? Uh, uh, I just hear this, and uh, this is great. This is for Top Gun." And I said, "Well, you guess you know I'm doing Fletch right now. Yeah, yeah, but this is this is rock and roll Top Gun." And he's he's leaving the studio, and and down the hallway I hear him. Da, 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 da. And so I so I, wow. I thought, so I thought about it, and I said, "Pooh, I probably should put this this little piece of music away because." It didn't really fit well anyway for the Chevy Chase uh, thing, so I put it away. And maybe, maybe I use it for something else. That's what you always do as a composer, you know. You have you have an idea; it doesn't work there, so you take it away and mm -hmm. maybe use it for something else. Um, Steve, now uh, talking about Steve Stevens. Steve Stevens was always I, I was always a fan of Steve, and I was a, a fan of his his very very unique way of playing guitar, playing rock and roll guitar. Yeah, this, yeah. Was not a, this was not your usual rock guitar. He was very, very conscious about his sounds, the way he, the way a guitar had to have uh, effects on how the delays had to work and, and the, the crisp factor or the distortion factor. And he was so absolutely keen and, and so together with his sounds. So I always thought I have to work with, with Steve at one time. And when it came when it came to the point where, where Brookham and Simpson asked me, "Do you have a melody already for Top Gun?" I said, and I said, "Yes, I have something." And I played them this little piece of music, and I knew that it has to be played by a guitar. And since it had to be played by a guitar, I knew it had to be played by Steve. Right. And um, I, I made a little piano demo and did. I, I put another guitar, guitar player on it because he because Steve was not available. They were in the in New York at that time. I was in LA. And so we played the, we played this demo to 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 um, Brookheimer and Simpson, and and uh, Jerry was thrilled and Don was thrilled. I recall. And they both said, "You know what? Let me let's play this to Tom." Wow. Tom was in, Tom was in town. I said, well, guys, but I have to shape it up a little bit. This is this is not really to, to <laughs> for somebody. So these are little tiny demos. No, no, it's great. So he said, um, Tom can be here at two o'clock in the evening, two o'clock in the morning, actually. Right? I said, well, right. you guys are crazy, but let's do it. 
So they, they, so there's a Tom Cruise coming in, a young, young Tom Cruise, and I'm playing him this demo, and, and he said, "Wow, it's it's absolutely awesome," and I, I still I still remember uh, him saying, "Can I have a tape of that?" Which back then was a cassette, you know. Right, so we, right, we did right. A, we did a cassette for him, and uh, when I, I met him recently before the shooting of of, of uh, Top Gun Maverick, he said, "You know what? I still have this cassette, and oh, I'm playing." Wow. It. I'm actually playing it every Fourth of July for the family. <laughs> oh, that is so cool, yeah. man! That is so cool. W w w was it an old Memorex uh, cassette? Yeah, it was some. I mean, he he must have. In the meantime, he must have transferred it to uh, to uh, the to some digital device. Sure, sure, sure. I'm not, I'm not sure that that Mr. Cruz is running around with a Walkman these days. Um, but um, he's he said, yeah, I still have the original tapes. Well, how how great. <laughs> And uh, for for uh, for Top Gun, um, because Top Gun was this amazing sort of combination of the concept of a music uh, composer yourself, uh, with also really great music supervision, right? And for people who don't know, the music supervisor traditionally in a movie is the person who kind of does the licensing and, and, and brings in the the licensed music, right? Like the needle drops. Um, and of course, you know, the uh, famous song, um, you know, uh, you know, Danger Zone, which I believe uh, Danger Zone wasn't a, a composed uh, originally for Top Gun, right? It was an existing track. No, I'm not it was, sure. It was composed for Top Gun. Georgia Moroda wrote it. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. I did not know and, that. Uh, and I think Kenny, I think Kenny Loggins did the, did the lyrics. I think. Wow. So, 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 yeah. so Danger Zone was an original song for yeah. the movie. Yeah. That's amazing. And then because you already had this amazing relationship with Giorgio, did you work with him on this track at all? Did you have any input into Danger Zone? No. Uh, he, uh, uh, Giorgio was, Giorgio did a couple of songs for Top Gun, for the first Top Gun movie, uh, including Take My Breath Away, which earns him an, an Oscar. Oh, wow. Um, I did not know. I have... what, what an incredible project. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was uh, amazing. Um, I was I was so busy with the score that I did not have any time or uh, just a few, just few time to write to write on songs. So the only so the only song outside outside um, uh, Top Gun Anthem, which is which is, was one of the key songs on on uh, on the first soundtrack, I wrote a, a Mighty Wings for for Cheap Trick. Uh, together with Mark Spiro, but but uh, uh, and I produced another one with with uh, Marietta, you know, a, a singer which I had a hit in wow. uh, Euro hit a couple of years ago. Um, but beside that, I was I, I was just too busy. These guys kept kept me busy with the score and and changing changing on the fly. The scenes had to be changed, and 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 then you of course you cannot you cannot go and and, and relax and, and and write songs. So Georgia took the opportunity and he wrote uh, uh, four or five songs for the soundtrack. You know, one, one other thing that is so iconic, um, and it's it just shows how powerful music is when you associate it with a, a memory and it can make you remember a smell or with a with a picture. When when the first trailer of the new Top Gun movie came out, um, this is like two years ago already, maybe even more. The first thing you heard was that boom. Like, like you, you, you heard that bell or like a gong, whatever, which I want to ask you what the actual sound is. But from the sound of one bell in one key in one note, you understand everything about what you're about to watch, you know, exactly. and, and, and that is the power of music. So it, what, what is that? Is that a bell? Is that a, what, what is that sound that kind of like starts everything? It's like the curtain coming up. On this right. piece, that, that's actually that's actually what, what you would find in a, in 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 the in the early in the early um, in first uh, generation FM synthesis. It's a tubular bell, and um, it is it's based it, it's actually based on the sound of a of a DX7 from Yamaha. Oh wow! And, but this is just the the the, the basic of it. Um, so this yeah. so this is not a this is not an analog instrument. This is an actual yeah. electronic interpretation of a sound. This is exactly this is a, this is a, a, a logarithm of of a of a tubular bell, 
But of course, it's not just that. It's not just just done with one one uh, uh, DX7 sound. You know, it's done with multiple different um, detuned and uh, uh, um, deteriorated uh, um, sounds of um, of different synthesizers, and of course, a, a a original tubular bell on it as well. And um, so it's a conglomerate, but it's it's something extremely unique. And as you say. Um, you hear the first tone on the new on the new movie, and you know what the, the movie, what the music is gonna be <laughs> for the next so for the cool. next two hours, and it really works, you know. Yeah, it really works. So, guy, man, we are we're running out of time here. I want to be yeah. very respectful to you. We're we're already fifty minutes in, and and, and yeah. I haven't gotten through even a third of my questions. But um, I I want to um, because similar to how Georgia Moroda was doing. Take my breath away in danger zone. Um, I have to ask you about this because this is a song. So I make video games and um, I worked on a video game called Grand Theft Auto uh, Vice City, uh, which is a kind of a very popular game that came out in 2002. And one of the songs that we always used to listen to, first of all, we had a poster of Don Simpson in the office and like, yeah. he was like our hero, you know, like with, so I'd love to ask you a few things about him, but anyway, the song that we used to always listen to in the office to kind of get us excited was Shakedown, which is a song from the second Beverly Hills Cop. And it was a chance for you to do what Georgia Moroda kind of did. Now that I understand the story, it makes so much more sense that it allowed you to create a wonderful piece of music, but introduce a lyricist uh, into it. What was that process like? Because you had to, now with Beverly Hills Cop 2, which is also a great movie, you had to kind of follow up the success of the first one and you introduce this song, Shakedown, which was nominated for an Oscar, right? Just like Georgia Moroda got Take My Breath Away, you kind of followed in that, like in those footsteps. What, what was creating Shakedown like? Well, it came actually out of the first of the first Beverly Hills Cup, because we, the, I, I wrote a song together with Keith Forsey, which was The Heat Is On, which which was sung by Glenn Fry. Oh, that's a so, great... Did you... You did The Heat Is On? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, my God. I, I'm sorry. I for, forgot about... I mean, that is no, incredible. <laughs> no, no, no problem. But it was like it was like the recipe. Um, and, and Simpson and, and, and Brookhammer said... So you guys, you wrote a great song in the first place for them for a movie, and you you should you should really you should really write the the the, the title song for Beverly Hills Cup too, and we were we were always um, fiddling around for 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 days and days and days and and looking for a looking for a punchline, not knowing that we had it already. So the heat is on. We were always looking for a chorus, uh, and then all of a sudden we said, you know what? We we have the chorus because the heat is on is already the, the chorus of the song, <laughs> right, and we, are, we we should not we should not we should not look for for another for another punchline because that's it. But it's very hard, you know, to to get over that and and uh, and not and and, uh, and and try to try to um, put it put uh, put another layer of things on top, you know. Just just do it and and relax and and think and say um, it works. Just say it works and then um you play it to somebody else and if somebody else says it works then you already you have one fan and out of that you might get a million fans yeah. so it was the same the same thing with with uh with um with uh beverly hills cup too and we had we had this idea keith is a very a rhythmical guy he mm -hmm. has he, he is a, he's one of the greatest drummers anyway so he, all his his work and everything um, is is towards rhythm, and we we used a very very fast rock and roll beat, and in the in the first first place we 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 even thought we could we could excite um, Glenn Fry again to sing it, but he was he was from the very very first moment um, he was I don't know I don't think it's my song, right? And he, he tried and but then all of a sudden he said no guys I, I have to turn this down this is not this is not Hedy's on. And maybe he was right. <laughs> he was he was right because because he, he, the heat is on was a huge success for him, and um, maybe just um, being the same the same uh, the same soup on another on another on another cup, you know, right, um, right, would have probably been not right. So we were in despair because we didn't have a singer, and we promised Brookheimer that that, that we did, we're delivering the track. 
So we got help from Erwin Azov, head of MCA Records. He said, you know what, let me call Bob Seeger. Maybe he, he, might, be, he might be a choice. Um, so I, I took a demo, and I, I'm driving out to Bob's house somewhere in Malibu or in, in, in Santa Monica. I don't know, I forgot. Yeah. And I played it to him. And he said, yeah, I like it. I do it. And um, a couple of days <laughs> cool. later, he made, we had him in the, in the studio, and we, we, we cut the track. Yeah, it's a great, it's a wonderful track. And like for us, I remember back in the studio when the song goes into the a cappella mode, you know, yeah. where you take away all of the music, and it's just like the a cappella is like when you really are in the middle of the you know of the shakedown, you know, like it, it, it was so cool. What was this like an inspiration that you had to like experiment with acapella because even that is not something that a lot of people were doing back in those days especially for like a movie right like 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 uh you know your your acapella thing was that something you had from the beginning or was that something that you introduced as you were recording it came it came in the middle of recording because we knew that 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 uh, a, a shakedown is 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 always going to be to be faster and 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 we always pounding more against against the uh, rhythm and, 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 and another chorus and another solo or whatever. So where you go from there, you cannot, you cannot, um, you cannot go to heaven. I mean, you have to go, you have to come back somehow. And since we all know that, that uh, a rest and a, 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 a very, very sparse part can be a very, very, um, right. a very the high rest. weapon, you know, to, to, to achieve what you wanted to achieve and then come back with the chorus. So actually it was Keith coming up with the idea. He said, you know what, let's just break it down to nothing. Let's just use the, <laughs> the, 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 the vocals. And we experimented with that. And then we made a number out of it. That, that's beautiful. So look, um, as we're wrapping up here, one thing that I do want to chat with you, um, first of all, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much. Um, oh, your you book, know. Uh, where's my orchestra? Um, my story. Um, does that basically for people that want to dig deep into all of these things? Is that what the book is about? Is kind of like your history through the music industry? It is. It's actually the history of my life. It's it's my it's my my beginning. As you asked me the the the, the first question, um, mm. how did you come into music? Actually, the book the book starts. Um, with my name is Harold because Harold is not a German name. Harold is an American name. So where does where does where does this name come from? It comes from my godfather who was a was a was a colonel in the in the U.S. Army. Oh wow! Uh, after the the Second World War, and he was friends with our family, and he said, um, "We don't." He and his wife, we don't have any kids. But if you if you have a kid. Um, I want to be, and, it, and it's a boy. I would, I would love to be the godfather of of your kid, and that's 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 how my name is Harold and not Harald or, or or whatever, you know. Right. So that's how the book starts, and it it and the book uh, uh, guides you to to a piece of a, a pop history, to to my story, my my work with uh, Donna Summer, my work with uh, with orchestras, my work with not orchestras, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, it it uh, it uh, the the title the title is 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 somehow a synonym of 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 my life because this was this was the the question um, the executives from Paramount asked yeah yeah now it we, makes sense when we delivered when we delivered the first the, the first uh, piece of of score and, and they said where's the orchestra <laughs> yeah. and we said there's, there is no orchestra <laughs> and I use this line because because I think it mirrors uh, perfectly. The way I'm doing music, very, very reduced, without a lot of pomp. You know, I mean, the other, the the other uh, great colleague of mine is Hans Zimmer, and he does exactly the opposite. He has he has huge orchestras, he has right. huge uh, setups, and mine was always a minimalistic kind of thing. So that's why it's called uh, um, "Where's the Orchestra?" and uh, it leads you through my life. It, it it leads you to my my ups, and of course to my uh, through my downs. I had uh, uh, bad times uh, with my health once, you know, and all that. And it shows you um, how I uh, succeeded to to uh, still be alive, you know, Amen. and to not to not uh, drown anywhere, you know. So it's no, um, that's I that's very it's, inspirational. I'm going to definitely pick it up and, and read through it. Um, yeah. Did you um, did you work um, with Hans Zimmer on the score for Top Gun Maverick? Um, were you yeah. involved pretty heavily in in, in Maverick? Yeah, I did. I did start in in 2018 in winter with uh, the first with the first layouts, 
and I actually worked through the entire uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, 2019. And I ended in somewhere um, in 2020 in, in winter, because then then I said I have every I have done everything what I could. I, I wrote I wrote like two two hours worth of music, and um, then uh, I think um, Hans and 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 Lauren should continue with with the whole thing because I don't I don't I, I had everything covered, right. and uh, Brooke Hammerkorn said, well, um, Tom loves everything you did so. Um, I think you did a great job, and and um, if you if we need something else, um, um, we we gonna we gonna get back. But but uh, Jerry said, uh, you know, I think Hans should do something as well now, and um, right. that's, and the outcome we see, and it works really good, and and the movie is a huge blockbuster, and oh, it's mo a great movie. Have you seen the movie finished? Yeah, I have I have I have I have uh, seen it finished a couple of weeks ago, just before. Just before the uh, before the release, and uh, and I demanded it because I'd be, everybody right. asked me to, to do an interview about it, and I didn't know how they really finished it. And I said, I'm not doing an interview un until I saw I, I saw it because yeah, I, don't yeah, yeah. What, I don't know what I wouldn't know what to say, you know. But um, so they showed me the movie, and it's really it's a it's a great it's it's just it really is a good movie. That. It yeah, really yeah. is a good movie, and, and, and like I'm a pretty harsh critic, you know, when you when you're younger you're less critic than when you get older and you get like all tainted by life. But yeah. it really is a very, very good movie. Um, did is. you work yeah. at all with Lady Gaga with her original track or? Yeah. No, 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 I didn't. I, I didn't. I didn't. Um, uh, um, in, I wasn't involved anyway when, 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 when Gaga came in. This was, right. I was gone already. Yeah, yeah. Right. And my last question, because I have to, I have to ask um, what, what, what do you remember, or I mean, obviously we've already spoken about so much of it, but what do you take with you from your experience with Don Simpson? What, like, what is it about Don Simpson that maybe, if anything, maybe it's nothing at all, that kind of gave you a little bit of a lesson about life and, you know, um, your passion or whatever? Is there anything from Don Simpson? Because for me and my film student, like my film school colleagues and my rock star game colleagues, he was such an inspiration to us. But back in those days, there wasn't a ton of internet. There wasn't social media. Everything that you heard about him, you read through Sight and Sound magazine or a teacher would tell you. What 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 was Don Simpson like, and what did he mean to you? You know what what I what what I uh, draw most from from Don is the ability to change his mind from one second to the other and he had he had he had absolutely mastered the art of kill your babies um, mm. what what we always said what what actually what what this is a line from 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 alfred hitchcock but you get you get so close into into what you're doing and you think whatever you did is the center of of the earth it's the it's the, the center of intelligence but it could be a moment where this center of intelligence is absolutely um, wrong. And you have to be open-minded to throw these things from you and start anew and start something completely different. And he showed me, he, sh he really showed me this a couple of times. He said, you have to just throw it away now and do something else. And, and, and when I said, yeah, but Don, this is not, this is, this is a great piece of music. And he said, so use it for something else, but throw it away. Keep your, something new. And this was, this was Don. I mean, Don, Don was, was, was trying to, to drive left and he drove right over a fire hydrant, <laughs> you know? So this was Don's life. He was crazy, but he was very, very creative, you know? And together with, with uh, Jerry Bruckheimer, the businessman, the, 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 the cool guy, you know? Right. And with this, with this crazy Don, this was like a yin yang, you know? And yeah. Were... Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, well, well, uh, Harold, man, this has been such an honor for me. Thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you guys for listening. Uh, I'll put all your links below uh, to your book. Um, Where's my orchestra? My story by Harold Faltermeyer. Uh, check out all his movies, man. Like, you know, Tango and Cash. We didn't talk about. That's another great movie. Uh, Cuffs with Christian Slater. That's another really cool movie. Um, you know, you, you um, just recently you uh, worked on Cop Out with uh, Kevin Smith. Um, right. Is there... 
are you actively performing or composing now or are you pretty much just relaxing pursuing hobbies no 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 i'm not relaxing doing my hobbies I, I, you know I, as a composer you cannot you cannot just shut down and say i'm i'm especially, retired. Yeah, especially when you have the talent too right this, this is this doesn't work you know this is this is this is what what my what my wife said in in the in the book where's the orchestra she said she said you are not allowed to go in reti retirement with this kind of talent this right. would be illegal you know you can't right, do that right. it'd be a know? sin it'd be a straight up it's, sin it's, it's, it's and and i i have to create all, all the time you know what what i what i like to do is is uh, to create something something else for example i just wrote a a theatrical play Oh, with wow. uh, with two people, which is which is a new it's actually a new form of of theater. It's a I would call it like a, a mini musical. You know, it has a couple of songs and a couple of sujets which, which drive the story, but it's completely different from what I ever did. You know, and this was so much fun with two two very very great uh, um, uh, actors in in uh, to uh, to work with those in Germany, and the and the piece is a, is a huge success already. It's oh, a, it, now, it's it's in an off in an in an off kind of off Broadway situation right now in Bonn in our former capital, and it's playing um, there for for like six weeks, and and they get standing ovations every evening. And we move on to to Berlin in the in the well known uh, Schiller Theater, in uh, let me see in uh, July twenty seven, and oh, we nice. play there for fourteen days, and then we go through Germany with the whole piece, and that's fun for me, you know, doing something different, not always doing the same thing, and um, that's awesome. As long as as, as, long as it it involves music in some way. That's awesome, man. I'm glad to see that you're still active. Your work is legendary, and I think it shaped an entire aesthetic you know we were talking about don simpson and high concept but i believe that your work actually shaped the miami vice vibe that's still the most popular vibe to this day right like that 80s kind of emotional electronic music like it came from that you know and people still use that as a very strong piece of nostalgia for a very specific moment in time so, Harold, thank you so much for your contribution to the art form. And uh, hopefully I'll get to chat with you again someday. Oh, yeah, I would love to. It was, it was really fun, Mark. Thank you. All right, cool. Well, thank you all, and we'll, we'll talk to you guys soon.